Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to see so many young people. Um, I want you to indulge me and just, you young folks, let me pretend that I'm your mother today. Uh, because my older son, who just turned 27, is, is somewhere on I-10, uh, driving from ja uh, New Orleans to Jacksonville to begin his brand new life as a brand new doctor. And, and, and my maternal feelings are, are a little bit churned up at the moment, so I'm so glad to see so many young people. Um, I want to um, set a tone for this talk. And Lauren said she would like for me, after you've been working hard all morning, to, you know, do something a little fun and, you know, entertaining. So that, hopefully that's what we'll be doing today, partly informative. And am I supposed to be wearing something? Or is this, this okay if I talk through this thing? Okay. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> so how many people have heard of intelligent design creationism? So you know what that is. How many people know who William Dembski is? He's one of the leading intellectuals of the movement, one of, one of the founders of, of the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture. Okay, so you know who he is. And you know what the Kitzmiller trial is, right? And the, the, the jury, I mean, I'm sorry, the judge gave his decision on December 20th, 2005. Well, what I'm going to show you now, before I actually begin my real presentation, is how William Dembski marked the first anniversary of the Kitzmiller decision. This came out shortly before Christmas of last year. Now, look, listen, because there are sound effects, okay? And there's a really good sound system. <laughs> Did you hear it? <laughs> Did you get all the sound effects? Does anyone need to hear it again? Okay, let's do it again. Listen one more time. Be because the, the sound effect of a, of a particular body function is what you want to get. So we'll do it again. Okay, so now you know what to listen for. No, like I said, I want to set a tone for this presentation. And the sound effects continue as you pass your cursor along there. There's me, by the way. Uh, there's Richard Dawkins, Eugenie Scott, and my friend Ken Miller. Now, the voice that you're hearing is William Dembski's. Um, some, some of you geeks out there probably know how to do what a geek uh, at Panda's Thumb did and, and do an analysis of the voice, and, and, which was slowed down, speed it up and match it with Dembski's voice. And once he did that and posted it, um, Dembski admitted that it was his voice. This is one of the people who's going to revolutionize the scientific world. This is his work. So, okay. Hmm? Yes, that would be nice. So now that the tone is set, we will go into my presentation. Yeah. You mean move that? Okay. And we can push this out of the way. Okay. okay. All right, can you hear me? No, I think she has to do something, just to adjust the volume, right? Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? That's okay? Oh, I can hear myself, so that, okay, right, great. Okay, well, um, I'm going to use the Trojan horse as my motif, uh, and, and you'll see that it's, it's a really a very, very good metaphor for what is going on here, and give you a little bit of closer look at the intelligent design movement. You all know the, the ancient legend of the Trojan horses, which is a wonderful story that we've all heard as children and a, probably a not so good movie. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Uh, might be worth going just to look at Brad Pitt. So. 
Um, it's also the name for a nanoparticle that's been developed to, to deliver cancer drugs to tumors, uh, which is interesting, I think. It's also the name of a really good book, uh, which is <laughs> on sale outside, which is a little cheaper than I have it listed here. It's out there for $15. I think Oxford is selling it for $19.95, but it does have a new chapter, which includes the Dover trial and some other updated information. But really the most apt use of this metaphor is, is the computer program that looks very benign called a Trojan horse. It's not a worm and it's not a virus. It's, it's a piece of, saw, it's a program. And I'll just, you know, what it says here is, and I found this on the website at the bottom there, a Trojan horse is a program that appears to have some useful or benign purpose but really masks some hidden or malicious code. In this case, the Trojan horse and the unsuspecting user become the entry vehicle for the malicious software on the system. Remember the attacker's main goal, to disguise their malicious code so that users of the system and other programs running on the system do not realize what the attacker is up to. Well, I found out that that, I think that works really, really well to describe what, what, uh, now Trojan Horse Metaphor, that was Oxford University Press's idea. I didn't like the title at first, but it's turned out to work really well. A Trojan Horse is a proposal to, quote, teach the controversy about evolution that appears to have some useful or benign purpose, for example, to promote critical thinking. All of this is what the Discovery Institute says, by the way but really masks the plan to teach intelligent design creationism. In this case, the Trojan horse and the public school system become the Discovery Institute's entry vehicle for teaching a religious belief in the public school science class. Um, so the federal judges do not realize what the ID movement is up to. And thank to, thanks to Judge Jones, that's a bit more difficult than it used to be. But they're still at it, as you'll see. Um, and the, the, the Trojan horse rolled into Dover, Pennsylvania in October of 2004. Now, it wasn't the Discovery Institute. In fact, this lawsuit was the last thing they wanted. They did not initiate it, and they could not control it, which they, and I explain more about their reluctance to see this suit go forward in, in the book, but they didn't want it. It was really the, uh, the two guys on the school board, and they were assisted by uh, the Thomas More Law Center, and I'll get into that in a second, but these are our wonderful plaintiffs. I only have pictures of, of a few of them not all of them, but Tammy Kitzmiller was the lead plaintiff. It was she who filed the initial complaint. Uh, her daughters went to uh, go to Dover High School. So these are our wonderful, these are the heroic people in this whole um, business here. And Dover is a very picturesque little town. It's near Gettysburg. And you, you can see that it's just a really beautiful place. There is the Dover Area High School. So it's just a picture perfect setting, but this little town got ripped apart uh, during this ordeal. Uh, what the school board did at the instigation of a couple of the board members was in October 2004 to pass a resolution um, ordering that ninth grade biology students would, would be taught about intelligent design, that they would be made aware of gaps or problems in Darwin's theory, which is classic creationist talk. And then the next month, they um, put of pandas and people, a creationist textbook, in the library uh, for their students to consult. They, one of the board members, William Buckingham, actually tried to blackmail the teachers into accepting this as a supplemental textbook, PANDAS, you'll hear more about that later, um, in order to get them their new standard biology book. And they, he, that wouldn't, that just didn't fly. And so they put it in the library as a reference book. Uh, 58 copies, 60 were purchased, 58 went into the library. And so those parents filed suit. Now this is the book of PANDAS and People. Um, the two board members who instigated all of this, and this really started uh, in 2002. Uh, this didn't start in 2004. They had been agitating for the teaching of creationism for two years. Alan Bonsell and William Buckingham um, took up the money at Buckingham's church, gave it to Bonsell's father to buy the book under the table to keep it off the books of the school board. And um, so they bought Pandas. And note the, the co-author there, Dean H. Kenyon, along with Percival Davis. These are the co-authors of the book. Dean Kenyon's name will come up in a little while. Um, and so this generated a great deal of, of publicity, controversy. Uh, Dover became the butt of jokes. Uh, the campaign to defend the Constitution added it to their map of the islands of ignorance. There it is. There's Dover there. Uh, a lot of cartoons. And Samantha Bee, you probably saw this maybe, um, did a little spot on The Daily Show called Until Hell Freezes Dover. And I, I, I can't imagine, having seen it, I can't imagine that it made the people that live in Dover very happy um, that she did this. But it, it did make Dover the butt of just gazillions of jokes and cartoons. 